Hello and welcome to Choose a Fi. I'm your host, Brad Barrett, and today we have a returning guest. We have Samantha, who is known as the Dentist. So she was on episode 98 way back when, actually four years ago. And Sam is a dentist who took out $550,000 worth of student loan debt, hence the title, The Dentist. So yeah, I'm really excited to have Sam back on the show to just get an update on where she's been over the last four years, how her debt repayment has gone, and just a general life catch-up. So welcome to Choose FI. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Sam, welcome back to Choose Vi. It's so great to have you back. Thanks. It's nice to be back here. Yeah, this should be fun. This should be fun. So it has been almost exactly four years since we recorded last. So you're on episode 98. And yeah, you obviously gave us your whole history and, and what was going on. But let's catch the audience up real quick on just an abbreviated version of, of your story. So Let's start with the student loan debt, because I think that's really the, the most interesting aspect for today's conversation, right? So you went to USC for dental school, and as I understand it, it cost over $500,000? Yes, exactly. So I took out $550,000, but by the time I was graduated, you know, there's interest on that and everything. I think it ended up being like a little over five seventy five, dollars just crazy. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So $575,000. So, okay, the interest does start accruing while you're still in school. Is that generally how it works? Yes. Okay, gotcha. And I think I think you had said at the time, so this was 2017 at least, it was about $135,000 a year for dental school. Does that sound roughly accurate? Yeah. Okay, talk me through, at the time you had said you had taken graduate plus loans I think uh, there are obviously a lot of people in the audience familiar with student loans, but a lot of people unfamiliar. Generally, how do those work? Is there a limit? I mean, I guess if you could take over $500,000 of these debts, I'm assuming of these loans, I should say, I'm assuming there's no limit, but do you have any sense of that? At the time, I don't think there was a limit. I actually had to take out the graduate plus loan because I originally took out the federal student loan, but that had a cap. I think the cap was like 20 something thousand at the time. And so that wasn't obviously going to cover the amount it was going to (laughs) cost to go to school for a year. So I had to take graduate plus loans on top of that. Okay, gotcha. So that makes sense. So this fills the gap for people who are in graduate school, want to obviously pay for that amount, but just simply can't do it through savings, through earnings, or through those federal loans. Okay, exactly. that makes sense. So Right. We were at 550, maybe 575 is, is the updated version. And I think you had said, so there are a bunch of repayment options, right? I know you had talked about IBR, which is, as I understand it, income-based repayment. Now, can you talk us through generally how that works and also like the specific path that you decided to take? My path is kind of all over the place. So I mm-hmm. did. I started at IBR. IBR is one of the student repayment plans that they have out there. They have pay, repay, and IBR. And then they also have public loan forgiveness program as well. But IBR is the most basic one. I think it was the one that's been out there the longest as well. I signed up for it because it was just very straightforward, easy to get into. It was actually the one I was automatically entered into from grad school. But since then, I have actually changed to repay because Repay had a a certain benefit where in the first three years, they pay half of the interest that you owe. So after talking to, actually, I switched after I talked to you guys on your podcast, because I spoke to Travis Hornsby of Student Loan Planner. Really? Yeah. And he said, hey, you know, you could really benefit from switching from IBR to Repay because Repay will give you 
three years of paying back half of your interest. So I said, okay. So I did that. And that brought us to the pandemic shutdown where it went to zero (laughs) percent. Right, right, right. Okay, I want to hear all about that. But just first, a quick sidebar, because you did bring up Travis. And and actually, so this is episode 395, which is releasing September 19th of 2022. And we actually just had Travis on episode 391. And we basically called this quite possibly our most important episode of all time, just because student loans are such a big issue obviously for so many millions, tens of millions of people and many people in our community. And because of some of the government programs and waivers that are available for forgiveness, that I guess it's very, very timely through potentially October 31st, 2022. And it's possible that those are going to get extended, but at least as of now, that's still accurate as the time we're recording this. So for anybody listening who has student loans, please go back and listen to episode 391 with Travis Hornsby. Sam, as you did, he has a company called the Student Loan Planner, of which he generously offers a discount to Chooseify listeners. So if you go to the show notes at chooseify.com slash 391, now is a really, really, really important time to consider this. And obviously, Sam, we're going to talk about this during our episode here. So sidebar over, really super important and very, very timely that we talk to Travis and be following up here with you about about your own student loans. So, okay, the pandemic hits, right? So you were paying, I think you said when we last talked, you were paying something like $6,500 a month down against your student loans. You were trying to pay them off really, really aggressively. When you spoke with Travis and changed your repayment option, did that $6,500 a month change or did you continue paying that amount? Like, were you required to pay a smaller amount, I guess? And then what did you actually continue paying? Well, we were required to pay under IBR, it was 15% of your income from the previous tax year. Under repay, it's 10% of your income from the previous tax year. But we still continued to pay 6500 every single month because we wanted to kind of stay on track. And the biggest help by switching was that instead of like our our money would go to the interest first, correct? And then it would go to the principal. But since the repay was paying half of the interest, more of our money was going towards the principal. So that helped us a lot. Oh, that's incredible. Now that that repay option, is them paying half of the interest, is that a standard thing? Is that a, if you switch from IBR, I'm just not familiar with this. Do you know if that's broadly applicable? Yeah, so that's broadly applicable, but I didn't know that before talking to Travis. So nice. he really did save us like thousands of dollars. Oh my goodness. That's, yeah, that's incredible. It is, it's astonishing just having specific information on these very complicated programs. It, it's yes. similar, obviously, I don't think I'm anywhere near as knowledgeable as Travis is for student loans as I am for tax and taxation, obviously, but, but I am a CPA and just knowing these little intricacies, it does make a difference. And I think a lot of us in the FI community love to be DIY people, right? Like we in every aspect of our lives. But I think that's one thing that I've opened my mind to from Choose I is sometimes it just pays to pay an expert for advice that you simply couldn't figure out on your own in all likelihood without spending dozens or hundreds or thousands of hours. And that amount that you can pay sometimes, that small one-time fee can, in your case, I mean, thousands, tens of thousands of dollars possibly, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's funny that you say that because I'm the same. I'm generally the type of person that's like, I can figure it out on my own. I don't need to outsource or like pay somebody to do the work for me, but you just don't know what you don't know. And so without knowing that stuff, you you can't really like get anywhere. For example, like with this new thing that just passed where 10K will be wiped off of everybody's student debt, most people don't actually realize that if you made payments since the pandemic, since March 2020 to now, you could get a refund of those payments. So for example, one of my friends, she was making payments the entire time. She had $8,000 and she made payments from March 2020 to now, and she's at 5,000, which will get wiped off. But I said, hey, apply for the refund and you'll get that 3,000 back and you'll still get your 8,000 wiped off. So like these little things that people... I mean, and she was like, oh my God, I never knew. But you just don't know unless you talk to like someone who's really in it, you know? (laughs) Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Like you said, you don't know what you don't know, right? And that's, I think 
the the biggest thing that I hope that come from from this episode and from people going back and listening to 391 is if you have student loans or you know anybody who has student loans right now, especially right now with this new forgiveness option with the 10K, like you said, that President Biden just passed through and all of this stuff, like now is the time to really drill down on am I possibly capable of getting benefit from these things, right? So I think, unfortunately, from a podcast where we're talking to many, many, many tens or hundreds of thousands of people, we can't give specific advice. But I think that's the biggest broad advice is if you have student loans or you know anybody that does, which is pretty much everybody, you need to start paying attention right now because also time is of the essence with a lot of this stuff. Right. Yeah. There's cutoffs. There's deadlines you don't want to miss. Yeah, no, definitely. So let's kind of go back in time, but we're fast forwarding the story here. So the pandemic hits in, you know, March of 2020. And what then happens to, I guess, student loans generally, but obviously with your experience, what happened with with your student loan then? So at that time, we had been paying 6,500 a month towards the student debt. We had brought our student loans down to about 430,000 on March of 2020. Then the pause hits. And so we said, we didn't know at the time what the pandemic would bring, you know? And so we're like, okay, well, we don't want to throw all our money into the debt. It's at 0%. Let's save that money. So we made the minimum payments still, but we stopped making our 6,500 payments and we opened a high yield savings account. We put all of our money that we would be putting towards loans into a high yield savings account. And we've done that this whole time. So yeah. Right now, the loans are probably at about 410 because over the last two years, we've been doing like the minimum payments. Gotcha. Okay. This is super interesting because obviously it brings up a larger question that's like the age old question in the FI community going back to like your mortgage of like, do you pay down your mortgage aggressively or do you save and put it in, let's say, index funds or some, some other investment vehicle and kind of let that ride, but potentially out earn? the interest that you were paying. So I guess we can talk about that, certainly, because I think it, it's interesting and, and tied together. But but just to clarify real quick, because again, I don't have student loans currently. So when the pandemic hit, you said the, the 0%, but then you also said that there was a minimum payment still. So talk me through precisely how that worked and the interplay between those two. So technically, it, it went to 0%, and then you didn't have to pay anything towards loans. They paused all payments. You don't have to. But the wording when they first introduced it was it was called, I think, like a deferment. And I know historically before, you know, if you have a deferment, I just wasn't sure what was going to happen yeah. because the wording on these loan forgiveness is like you have to pay 25 years. But if you're not making payments during a deferment before, it didn't count. Now, you know, at this time, they actually introduced an IDR waiver and a PSLSF waiver where they will count those deferment periods that you didn't make payments. But before that wasn't a thing. So I didn't want to not make the minimum payments when we could make them. And then later on, they'll come back and say like, oh, well, during that deferment, that amount of time didn't count or, you know, just have some sort of consequence. So that decision was actually just because it, everything was unknown at the time. And then it was just kind of like uh, just to cover our bases type thing. But the minimum payment wasn't that much, you know, because like I said, we went down to 10% of what we were making. So Yeah. It was still doable. Okay. So right. Because the income base for payment or your new, not IBR, but your new repay option went down to 10% of your income. Okay. That makes sense. Right. But like you said, that 0%, that's 0% interest rate. So every dollar of payment you were making went straight to principal, correct? Yeah. Got it. So right. Better safe than sorry. Let's just yeah. keep paying. You never like know. a tiny amount and it's okay. Like, you know. So, okay. But then the cool thing was because... I guess your employment was not affected during the pandemic or, or is Actually, that an assumption? <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> yeah. okay. 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 So a lot of things happened during the pandemic. So actually February, 2020, my husband was laid off before the March, 2020 shutdown. And he was working for a company he didn't like, and they were doing layoffs. And he, he already told his boss, like, you know, I was I wasn't really liking working at this company. I kind of want to try something different like coding. He's an engineer. Okay. So he said, can I volunteer to be laid off, <laughs> get the severance package, and then people who want to be here can stay here, you know, instead of me. And then so he did that not knowing there was going to be a shutdown. He signed up for a coding course, and then the shutdown happened. 
he ended up not going back to work till January 2021. And then for dentistry, our dental offices closed for, I think, a month. And I used to work at two dental offices. I was working five to six days a week. And then when the pandemic hit, we closed for a month. I went back to one office and was working four days a week. So definitely cut down the number of days that I worked. And then in November 2020, I experienced like burnout. And so I quit my job actually in November 2020. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Yeah. So a lot of things happened. (laughs) A lot of things changed during the pandemic. And I took a break and then I went back to dentistry January 2021, the same time my husband went back to work. But I only worked two days a week for a while, for a long time. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I made literally the worst assumption in the history of uh, podcasting <laughs> slash interviewing there. Oh, yeah, nothing nothing changed. Just I feel like everyone's life changed during yeah. the pandemic. So. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot to talk about, obviously. So basically, we, like you said, November of 2020, you actually stopped working entirely for essentially three months? Uh, Like a month and a half, because January 2021... I went back. Oh, beginning of January. So, yes. okay. So uh-huh. the half of November, yes. December. But I only went back to two days a week, which was a big change from January 2020 when I was working five to six days a yeah. week. But all of dentistry kind of slowed down a lot. You know, I think a lot of dental offices didn't reopen in 2020. And that's why I experienced burnout is because I don't know if you remember, but during the pandemic, the dentist was the last place you want to be at because it's like a respiratory disease. Right, like, you course. know, we didn't really know what it was. So people were like avoiding the dentist, but their treatments were becoming emergencies and bigger treatments. By the time they all came back, it was like the floodgates opened and it was just a mess at the dental office. So that's how I got burnt out. Yeah. I mean, you don't think about these like second order effects, right? Unintended consequences of, of things. But yeah, I guess that it stands to reason, right? People aren't going to the dentist. People are scared of going to, to the dentist as it is, right? Like, yeah. And then then they push it off, obviously, because of a very essential global pandemic, right? But some aspect of fear as well. Yeah, right. Then it would make every single one of your treatments more difficult, right? Almost by definition. Yeah. And for the longest time, people were coming in telling us like, my dentist hasn't reopened yet. It's been like six months and they still haven't come back. So then our office was just like super busy, like way too busy. So, yeah. yeah. Goodness. So, I mean, it, it certainly sounds like there were some significant benefits of pursuing the path to Phi, right? Like it sounds like your husband was able to, uh, and this is one of these interesting things, right? Like we make decisions with the best information we have at the time. We had the poker player Annie Duke on years ago and with her amazing book, Thinking in Bets. And there's this kind of bias called resulting that we all kind of take part in, which is you just look at the result of a decision and then kind of look back and say, if the result was positive, oh, it was a great decision. If the result was negative, it was a poor decision. And that's just clearly not the way to go through life, right? So like your husband made a decision that from my outside standpoint, like a position of strength. And I suspect some aspect of pursuing the path to Phi also gave him that strength to be in that position. And I guess at the beginning of February 2020, he didn't see five, six weeks later, obviously a a global pandemic sweeping through and shutting down the world. So I wonder, like, have you and him talked about that, about that decision and then the result of the decision and trying to like separate them in some sense. I actually think like the pandemic was such a, mm, it changed our lives, but for the better. I think before the pandemic, we would have never thought we both quit jobs that we didn't like or didn't align with our values in 2020. I think we wouldn't have had that space if we didn't have like what you guys call FU money. (laughs) You know what I mean? And we kind of went from like a scarcity mindset, which is a lot of my battle with like my issues around money is because I have a scarcity mindset. We went from that to having an abundance mindset of like things will all work out. We have, you know, reserve. We could do what we want. We can make decisions that are more aligned with like who we are, or where we want to go. And that wouldn't have happened if we didn't go down the path of Phi, I don't think. So actually what worked out for him was he, let's see, he got laid off in February of 2020 which means he qualified once the severance ended in April, he qualified for unemployment. But because the pandemic hit, 
he got the benefit of the extra stipend <laughs> during 2020 on top of his unemployment. So for some reason, it just aligned that like what he was receiving per month actually like was pretty close to his take home when he was working. So that was good. <laughs> yeah, which is funny how things just turn out that way. You know, it's not like we planned any of it. And he actually wanted to do coding because at the time, I don't know if you remember, we traveled a lot and our dream was to live in New Zealand and to move to New Zealand January 2021. So his idea was, well, let me do coding. It's like a six month course, which he ended up doing. And then he'll do a job in coding and then we can move and live wherever we want to. <laughs> well, that didn't happen because <laughs> the world was shut down for it a long time. It didn't happen yet. It didn't happen yet. <laughs> it didn't happen right? yet. <laughs> yeah. So then the other interesting thing was he paid for this coding course. He bought it in February and the coding course said, okay, well, we have a guarantee that when you take this coding course, you'll get a job in three months after graduating the course. <laughs> so he graduated the course, but of course the shutdown happened. There's no coding job. So he actually got the course for free because he applied for three months, couldn't get a job and they refunded him the entire money for the course. And then he ended up going back to engineering anyway, because engineering is now fully remote. So his job has been fully remote since January 2021. Oh my Isn't that God. crazy? That is incredible. Yeah, like you said, who you never know thought? where it's going to, who would have yeah. thought? I have to say, like, there's so much of this is mindset. And I think that's what's beautiful about just what you said over the last handful of minutes is you had that scarcity mindset. And I, I really want to drill into this. Like, now you have this abundance mindset. And it, it's so easy for us. Like, we can look at a reality and we can choose to look at things in a positive light or a negative light. And it doesn't change what actually occurred. But like you are choosing to look back in a very positive manner of like, even amidst, if you really think about it, like, you know, we lay out like your husband voluntarily quit his job just as a global pandemic was happening. You had burnout from your job and obviously this pandemic hit right? But yet, as you're recounting it, this was a period where so much good happened. Yeah. And, and I'm struck by the fact that like, all of that is in your head in the best possible way. Like, I mean that truly in the best possible way. That's a remarkable thing for somebody who just admitted to like, hey, I've always had a scarcity mindset. Like, how did that happen, Sam? I have no idea. I think quitting my job was a big thing. It was just like the most empowering thing I have ever done to walk away from a source of money when I've been afraid of money my whole life. You know what I mean? And so to be able to like make a decision that aligns with my values and not be afraid of it. I wrote a post about how I was very surprised to see that I reached financial independence before I paid back my debt in the sense that like I define financial independence by like not really relying on money to make your life decisions. And that was one of those moments where I was like, I made a life decision without letting money dictate what I was going to do. It was like very just, this is what I felt was right. It was the most right thing I've ever done in my whole life. And I, that really changed just the way I approached it. It was just like an eye-opening thing where it was like, oh, okay, we're one of the lucky few to be able to do these decisions. And yeah, I don't know how that happened. It just did. That is amazing. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> Good for you. I mean, right, I can just like feel the energy coming off you that like, it is a, a different mindset. You're a different person than you were. I when totally we am. Last. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I totally am. That's amazing. That is really amazing. And yeah, like that's, I think one of the beautiful parts about pursuing financial independence is that it truly isn't. And we can't say this enough times, right? Like, it's not just about getting to that five number, this like, wonderful, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And like, that's the only time where you start getting benefits from this. Like you start accruing benefits from pursuing FI and being more intentional about your life from day one, truly. If you want to like dial into like the facts, like Sam, again, you guys both were without jobs. You had 400 plus thousand dollars of student loan debt, but yet you're describing this as really one of the best things that ever happened to you. And I'm kind of uh, setting up these counterpoints here, not to like tell you, oh, things are bad. It's, it's precisely the opposite. <laughs> it's like, it is the most amazing thing because you did have the power that you didn't have previously. And that's what's so beautiful about Phi and just getting down that path, understanding that you have control over your money 
your money doesn't have control over your entire life. Yeah. And actually, I was going to say a lot of people, I think, are afraid to leave jobs that they feel like they depend on, even if they hate them or they know it's not good for them or it's a toxic environment or whatever. They have toxic coworkers. But when I quit my job, I was very surprised to learn that I think people around me are uncomfortable with the fact that I wasn't working because actually like two weeks after I quit, I had so many dentists be like, do you need a job? Do you want to work for my office? And that's how I ended up going back in January. One of my coworkers went home to Thailand to take care of her sick dad. And she's like, I need someone to cover for me. And I said, okay, I'll cover for you for, you know, a month, which turned into six months, which turned into a whole year. <laughs> and then I was working for a bakery before and they reached out to me and they said, hey, we need a wholesale director. Do you want to work part-time as a wholesale director? So I did that. It was like it opened opportunities by saying no, by shutting a door to something that I knew wasn't like good for me. It just ended up opening a lot of other doors. And so for anyone who's scared to like leave their work, I mean, I'm not saying leave it right now, you know, have a backup plan. But at the same time, there's other things out there that you might find is like better for you. That is so cool. So, okay. So you are now working kind of part-time-ish as a dentist, not, not the same five or six days a week. Are you still doing that? Are you working for the bakery part-time as well? Yeah, I am working for the bakery part-time as a wholesale director. So that's one of the things I do. But I've actually done what you and Jonathan talk about a lot, talent stacking. Yeah. So I don't know if you've been following along what I've been doing, but in 2019, I became an early morning baker, meaning I worked midnight shifts to bake off pastries. And then in June of 2019, I opened my own bakery and put bread in a coffee shop, a restaurant, a market. And I did that for a year until the pandemic shut down. And in 2021, I returned to the bakery I was doing early morning baking for, and I became a wholesale director, which is a sales position. So I put bread in coffee shops for them and manage accounts. And I actually do accounting, billing, so more of like finance stuff, which is kind of fun. And then I also dog sit. I open a dog sitting business in my community. So I've been dog sitting, which is fun because it's like a good de-stressor compared to dentistry. Like I'll come home and play with pets and it's just like, they're just so lovable and they just take out the stress in life. So I love that balance. That is wild. So, okay. So it's, it's pursuing passions because right, like somebody could be hearing this and saying like, Sam, you know, you're trying to pursue Phi, like looking at the old thought process of Phi, which was you have to get there as quickly as you can. Like this ridiculous notion of it's about earning a lot of money as much as you possibly can, getting there as quickly as you can, forgetting about the intervening years and how much you enjoy them. But obviously, you still have a significant amount of debt. You have a job that it sounds like you can pick up your career, your dentistry career you can pick up as few or as many days as you want. But it sounds like it now it's about the journey, really. And like, and these passion projects that most people don't have the guts to pursue. That's amazing, Sam. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, tell me more about that. So the actual decision, because again, like, there's somebody out there listening to this saying, like, Sam, you should go back and do six <laughs> days a week at the dental clinic. Like, Talk me through like the thought process there. Like, sure. is this a slam dunk? Like, are you going to do more days of dog sitting? Like, what does it look like now? And what's the plan for the future? So when me and my husband sat down with a financial planner at the very beginning and we decided to pay back debt, we made a promise and we said, we're not going to do it from a place of like deprivation, which is why we actually really loved your travel hacking. That's how we were able to, we went to eight countries in the last five years. We really? traveled, yeah, because of you. <laughs> it was awesome. Amazing. Yeah. And we traveled to different states. We wanted to make sure that choosing to pay back debt doesn't hold us back from also like living the life that we want to live. When I quit my job in dentistry, I had the space to kind of realize I can take things that I like to do, my hobbies or my passions, and I can make side hustle money from them. But the goal is not to make money. It's just the goal is to do things that I actually like to do, but also on the side, you know, like still get us further along. So currently I, I like to approach life with like a sense of balance. So I work dentistry three and a half days a week now, which is half of my week. And the other half of the week, I do things I like, like blogging, writing on the blog, dog sitting, and helping the bakery out. So 
it's just been really fun. I think it's a good balance and we're still reaching our goals, believe it or not. We're still hitting our numbers that we set out from the very beginning. So I think when we first talked, I said I wanted to pay it back in under 10 years, but we're hoping for seven to eight and we're still on track for seven to eight. Wow. And that's seven to eight from the beginning of- Yeah, from, from the beginning. Yep. Wow. Okay. So you're like halfway through potentially paying them down. Yeah, more than. <laughs> I'm pretty oh my excited. Goodness. Oh, Sam, that's amazing. Yeah. I love that word balance. Oh, what a beautiful word, right? Because that's what it has to be. This can't just be a depriving yourself, let's sprint to some phi number, right? Because what is on the other side of it then, right? Like you all of a sudden reach this number. What does life look like then? Most people don't have any sense because they've deprive themselves of so much joy and experimentation along the way of what they actually want their lives to look like. So yeah, I mean, what a beautiful word. And and just a a quick sidebar, you know, you mentioned travel rewards. We actually, uh, two weeks ago in episode 393, we had a travel rewards refresher. So for anybody hearing that, definitely go back and and listen to me and uh, Lynn Mettler talking through Travel Rewards. Uh, it's kind of an update to our episode way back when in episode nine. So uh, six years ago at this point. But I think Travel Rewards are one of the best, uh, we call them pillars of financial independence, where you can really take like one to two, probably a minimum. Lynn thinks it's significantly more than that, like free or close to free vacations every single year just by being intentional, right? And Sam, like that's what this is. It's about planning and being a little bit intentional with your credit cards and being a little bit flexible with your travel. And then you can travel anywhere in the world, essentially. Yeah. I still remember listening to that episode nine and it blew my mind. Like that was like five years ago. And every friend that I've ever, you know, told them to refer to that episode, they do the same thing now. They they use travel rewards and they love it. (laughs) That is amazing. So thank you. (laughs) Oh, you're so welcome. I love how you've taken all of this to heart. And I mean, just seeing your own transformation over over these couple of years, like that's the beautiful thing about FI, right? It's like it pervades every aspect of your life. Like it really, if you let it, right? If you take action and you're intentional about what you want, what you want out of life, as opposed to just sleepwalking, like it truly can, it can revolutionize every aspect and places you wouldn't even think, right? Like that mindset that you may not have even known. Some of us are just, are so unaware of these money scripts that are running in our heads that where did that come from? Where did that scarcity mindset come from, Sam, in your life? Like it could have come from your childhood. It could have came when your family moved here to the US. Like undoubtedly it's decades in the making. And yet you've been able to overcome that even amidst 500,000 plus of student loan debt and a global pandemic. Like that's a really pretty remarkable thing. Yeah. I think FI gives us like the control over our spending and our money if we approach it correctly. You know what I mean? I mean, people would be surprised or they are surprised to hear that like we still budget every week. We have a budgeting date every Sunday, (laughs) even though like, you know, we've already like you could say we've gone past that where our spending has already been like controlled, but we still look and we make sure like, okay, are we still aligned with where we want to go and what we want to do and what we value? That's cool. So that's every single week you and your husband have Yeah, we have, try to still do it. Yeah. <laughs> nice. What does the format of that look like? If, if you don't mind me asking, because I think a lot yeah. of people, my wife and I included, like we, we try to practice what we preach here on the podcast, but there's so many things that like that different guests talk about. And it's like, oh, I would love to do that. But it, even sometimes it's, Like the difference between a listener hearing you say, oh, we have this budgeting date or meeting or whatever you want to call it versus actually doing it sometimes might even come down to that one or two little, little pieces of information. Like, can you just talk us through like how that works for you guys? Yeah. So we still use YNAB. It's a app, I guess you could say it stands for you need a budget. YNAB is great because it brings in your spending on your credit cards and all that stuff automatically. And over time, it actually auto categorizes everything, which makes it simpler over time. So our budgeting dates now are much quicker, but we will still bring up topics like we'll see a spending and we'll we'll ask ourselves, is there a way where we could like think about this differently? Can we cut down on this somehow? Like what if we opted for a different option? So I don't know. It's pretty quick, actually. It used to be like we sit down for an hour. We go over like all our spending for the week. But now that it's being auto categorized probably takes five minutes. And then we have like a 
20 minute discussion about like some of the things we've spent on that week and if it was necessary or if it added value. Sometimes we'll be like, oh, we went to this restaurant and we paid this much money and I don't think it was really worth it. Like we could cook food better than that. So maybe we shouldn't go to that restaurant again. Maybe we should do some other restaurant next time. Just simple things like that. Yeah, Super. <laughs> I like that. But again, it, it's the, the line of communication, right? Like how many spouses do you think actually have those kind of even just general discussions of, hey, we spent $70 at that restaurant. Was it worth it? Yeah. Right? I can't imagine very many do. And then the next order effect of that is like, okay. And, and this is how I look at things like with my wife of like, what are we looking to get out of that situation? Like, are we looking for gourmet food? Was that the best way to do it? The answer might have been yes. Like when you know, we went to some fancy restaurants recently just because we wanted to try them or we haven't been in seven years or something crazy like that. And, and sometimes that is the best use of your time and money. But sometimes it might just be, hey, we're looking to spend time together. Yeah. And with inflation now, you know, it's actually been a really great way to keep tabs on like what restaurants have inflated more than others. For example, like when we went out for Chick-fil-A, let's say, I think our tab ended up being like $17. And we were like, oh, that's kind of high. But if we go to In-N-Out, it would be $10 or $12. So we were like, we just want burgers and fries. We want something easy. Like, let's go to In-N-Out next time. You know, and so it's like simple things like that, where both of these things probably gave us the same amount of joy, convenience, value, but one was cheaper than the other. So maybe let's lean towards this one instead of this one for now, because this one costs more. <laughs> yeah. Like silly things like that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's small, but it's not silly. That's the thing. Like it just the sheer fact that you're having that discussion, I think, strengthens your relationship. Yeah. Right? Like most people, again, and I don't mean to keep repeating this, but like most people aren't having those conversations. They're just kind of going through life and just ships passing in the night. And when you have a conversation, even on something as innocuous as, should we go to Chick fil A? Should we go to In N Out? That can strengthen the relationship. And that's way more important than obviously the person out there listening saying, oh, come on, we're talking about $7 yeah. here. <laughs> right? Who cares? It doesn't matter. And Sam, you're not arguing that the five or seven dollars matters. It doesn't. Yeah. It's but it's we just the have conversations issue. all the time yeah. about stuff like that. That's yeah. so cool. And those of us on the East Coast are uh, are dying a little inside hearing in and out, right? <laughs> well, what, what's do, what do you guys have that? Well, um... Yeah, I mean, we have five guys. We actually have uh, oh, here in nice. Richmond. We have Shake Shack coming here shortly, which we're Ooh, very exciting. very excited about. So <laughs> yeah, that'll be that'll be good. <laughs> we don't have to uh, plan our trips around the Atlanta airport anymore, like oh. my wife does, because <laughs> they, they have a Shake Shack in the Atlanta airport. So. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> and just a total sidebar, we actually had Jesse, the founder of YNAB, on the podcast in episode 165. So for anybody out there who is looking for some budgeting software, I know, Sam, obviously you use YNAB. A lot of people in our community love it. I have never really been a budgeter, but Jesse almost had me convinced. So if he could almost convince me, I think he can pretty much convince anybody. So yeah, if you're thinking about budgeting software, that would be a good one. So episode 165 to go back to. So, uh, you know, Sam, just real quick, I wanted to go back. So, you know, we, we kind of fast forward it because obviously so much interesting stuff has been going on, on in your life. But just going back to the debt real quick. So you said you were, I think 410,000 is the amount you have left right? Yep. Approximately. And are you still, because, because I think things are kind of up in the air as we're recording this in August of 2020 about like the 0% and like when that ends and like, what are the ramifications for that ending? And I guess your general repayment strategy as it stands now. Yeah. So it sounds like they're extending the deferment till like the end of the year. And then January, 2023 is when it would resume. So where we're at right now, is that what you were asking? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So actually the pandemic has been interesting in that it gave us the space to even dabble a little bit in investing. <laughs> but for the majority of what we made, we did save it in that high yield savings account that I was telling you about. And so we are at 410. I think with the Biden you know, forgiveness, it would be at 400. And I'm looking January 2023, we are going to be in the high 100s. If we take all of our savings and put it uh. into our student debt. And so that's kind of the plan. I still want to pay it all back quickly. 
So I think we'll be at around like 190 something in January 2023, which will be from 575. That's huge. I mean, we would have gone over like the majority of that exponential curve that we were talking about back in episode 98. That is incredible. Okay. So, right. You said like dabbling in investing. And I think this is important, right? Because for many people out there with significant student loans or or even just a mortgage that they're looking to repay in a really expedited fashion. Are you saying that, I guess, previously, were you not saving like in a 401k or IRA or even just like in after-tax savings in the stock market? Was it just all going to the student loans previously? Actually, no. We had 401ks, both of us, and we were putting in money into our 401ks. After we spoke in September 2018, we also bought a house. So we put money into like the real estate as well, but we didn't invest in like single investments, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, like (laughs) those kind of more fun things. So when the pandemic happened and we were still putting away 6,500 a month, you know, in the high yield savings account, we were like, well, let's just play a little bit in like these few avenues. I still am averse, I think, to risk. That's what I learned like in the last two years. I still saved a majority of the income that we made in a high yield savings account. It just, I'm not comfortable yet with a lot of investing, but it was cool to have the space to be able to like dabble a bit in crypto. And we did SPY, we bought some individual stocks. Uh, when you mentioned I bonds in a previous episode, we actually did do that too. So that was pretty cool. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's been a good option for people. I guess, you know, it's certainly based on on the current interest rates and it's impossible uh-huh. to know to know where that goes in the future. But yeah, there are some limitations on what you can put in each year, but I think it's uh ten thousand dollars per person. So it's it's a pretty significant amount of money, obviously. I think actually the cool thing was it's per entity. So if you yes. have like an S Corp, like dentists have S Corps, their business could do it, I think. Or if you have a trust, living trust. You could also do it through a living trust, something like that. Yeah, I know. I I did vaguely hear that it is per entity. Obviously, to anybody listening, this is not not financial advice. You have to look into that. I think it's treasurydirect.gov. But yeah, definitely look up all the details on that. But there are possibilities of of it just being more than you as as a single person. So yeah, yeah, that's very cool. So for the most part, you were putting that $6,500 a month into the high yield savings. Yes. And while... High yield is kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> it depends on your definition of high yield. It still obviously was earning some interest. And that amount is just stockpiling over the last two plus years. And like you said, now, once the 0% interest portion of your loan stops, then you kind of have an inflection point, or it sounds like you're, you're at least making an inflection point out of it of, hey, January 2023, do I consider taking that whole pot of money, which by the sound of it is is a little more than $200,000, do I let that continue growing, though at a the high yield savings probably is only 1% or 2%, or do I pay down my loans and pay off more than half of my loans at an interest rate that undoubtedly, I guess, you know, without me knowing specifically, is going to be higher than what you're earning in the high yield savings, right? Yeah. So just to give people an idea that interest rate would be at 6.8%. So it's really high. So that's why we kind of wanted to be really aggressive with the student debt because the sooner we can do it, the less interest it would be. So I'm leaning towards throwing it all towards the loans and then making a dent, a huge dent. Yeah, yeah, that's quite a dent. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Fifty plus percent dent in the uh, in the outstanding balance. That's pretty good. And and yeah, I mean that's where you start getting into like again that age old conversation of do I save and invest? It's like a horse race, right? Like yeah. do I save and invest and let that kind of run concurrently with paying down my normal debt? You know, usually at at a potentially smaller interest rate. When we're talking about like the mortgage interest, let's say that we've all been getting over the last handful of years, which obviously isn't quite as true anymore since the interest rates have jumped up a little bit. But in that case, to me, it always seemed like the mathematically optimal. And I think it's important to take a step back and say, like, the path to FI is not about just optimizing math. It would be easy to say that, but it just, it ignores the practical realities of of psychology being just so important. Like, the psychological satisfaction of paying down your debt is enormous. It's absolutely enormous. And I guess 
in your case, when you're talking 6.8% interest, I mean, it's hard to imagine that you're going to, at least by definition, do dramatically better than that in a concurrent investment, right? Like even if you put in the stock market. Yeah. Okay. You might get six, seven, eight percent, but there are years where it goes down, obviously. So I can understand that thought process of just paying it off and getting that guaranteed return of 6.8%. Yeah. And at this point, I think uh, when we decided to pay off the debt aggressively, we did talk about how like being in the midway point, like choosing to do it and then changing your mind halfway isn't as beneficial as either choosing to aggressively do it or doing the loan forgiveness. So yeah, we've kind of stuck to our decision and I don't know. It's just choosing to do that really helped me a lot too. Like you said, psychologically, it was such a like big mental barrier for me for a very long time that like it really did give me like the confidence and strength to say like, oh yeah, okay, I can have control over money. So that that was really nice. It was a good decision, I think. That is awesome. That is really, really amazing. I just love I love how how you've taken this and just taken control of it, right? And taking control of every aspect of your life and just truly living that balance like you talked about. And you're only going to accrue more benefits, more options, more potential balance, whatever that looks like. And the beautiful thing is it can change. It can always change. Who knows if you might fall back in love with dentistry? I mean, it, it sounds yeah. unlikely, right? But it's possible. And that's the beautiful thing is you can do what you want, especially when this debt is behind you. You have more flexibility, right? Like it wouldn't shock me. I'm not saying you're going to do this. It wouldn't shock me if you aggressively paid down your mortgage, right? Like it, it, you just never know where life is going to take you. And that's what's so cool about this. So Sam, this is amazing. I really wanted to thank you for coming back on the show, for reaching back out. I know it's been four years, but what a journey. What an absolute amazing journey. I'm just so happy for you and your husband. And it sounds like you have found that balance. It sounds like you've found options in your life that really were not available to you before you found the Phi community. So this is just a remarkable story. Thank you. It was really nice to be back after four years. I really do feel like a different person. I mean, Phi has changed my life. Wow. That is so cool. Yeah. Again, a huge congrats. And so Sam, obviously you have a website called The Deadest. And again, we'll spell that. So yeah, obviously the T H E D E B T I S T, the deadest.com. And you've got an amazing amount of, of articles. It looks like you have some courses on here and just all sorts of things about living an intentional lifestyle. It's a really wonderful site. I'd suggest anybody, anybody listening, check it out. We'll have it in the show notes as well. So chooseify.com slash 395 is where you find the show notes. We'll have links to everything we talked about today. But Sam, where can, uh, is there anywhere else that, that you're kind of living online or is that really the best way for people to get in touch with you? That's probably the best way for them to get in touch with me. I do have like subscribers who want updates on, you know, new things happening on the website. And I also have Instagram, which is at the dentist, same spelling, T-H-E-D-E-B-T-I-S-T. Wonderful. And yeah, there's a contact form on your website here. So yeah, anybody who's looking to reach out to Sam, definitely check out the dentist.com. So Sam, again, thank you so much for coming back on Choose If I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. 